Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. Hello and welcome to the Women Today podcast. We've had a pretty energetic week, joined by a boxing coach and a woman who's new to the sport, as well as a woman who competes in weightlifting and CrossFit. Outside of sport, we've also talked accountancy with Nicola Balker and asked how much responsibility we should take for our own safety. But first, we were joined in the studio by the incredibly open and honest Kat Turner. Now, our guest today will be familiar to regular Manx Radio listeners, and she wears a lot of hats, from <laughs> environmental campaigner to published author, and, of course, most recently, Douglas Borough Councillor. Kat Turner, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thanks very much for inviting me. As I say, you are involved in all sorts of things. How on earth do you begin to answer that dreaded, so what do you do, question? That's a really good question. Um, I guess... The thing that I identify myself with most at the moment is ecovanning, so the day job. That's um, if somebody asks what I do, that's that's what I would I would say. Or depending who they were, I might say I'm the mother of two amazing little girls. Um, but it does tend to be a bit of a juggling match, and just as with today, you can have days where you've got time allocated for this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then you have a sick little girl, and the whole thing goes to pot. Um, so you have to go with the flow a bit. We should say your your beautiful daughter, one of your beautiful daughters, is sat in the corner of the studio. She seems to be engrossed in something technological. and She's she's hiding under your desk, isn't she? Oh, she's <laughs> sneaking up, Fiona. She's sneaking up. Well, we, maybe we'll have a word with her. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but we are going to talk more about your political involvement and recent election to Douglas Borough Council a little later in the programme. Okay. But I am really intrigued by the fact that you've actually written 17 books yeah, they're not exactly um, gripping page turners, I have to say. The vast majority of them have names like um, land law and personal lending or um, financial planning for old age. I can see you glazing over already. <laughs> no, no, I am, I'm heading on the way to the bookshop. Hooray! <laughs> um, so I answered an advert quite some years ago from the Institute of Financial Services who were looking for authors to write study texts. And the advert said, can you write? And I thought, hmm, let's see. And um, 17 books later, there we go. Do you enjoy <laughs> that process of writing? I mean, you must do, having written do. 17. Yeah, um, I was really lucky because I got the opportunity to write for a huge um, range of ages and types, from um, right up at degree level um, with the land, land, land law and lending, um, down to books for um, school kids, uh, 14 to 17 year old, on financial capability. And that was a fantastic project because um, we wanted to help kids see through, um, first think about where they got their financial values from. Are you a saver or a spender? How do you prioritise? But also to see through the guff that some financial companies put on their marketing spiel. So will this really make, will this bank account really make you be the person with the big car? How do you know when you've written something good that other people will find interesting or useful? Oh, you ask them. That's 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 what I do. Um, and that kids experiment was ex- was a was a wonderful example. I did a first draft and tried it out on some fourteen to seventy year olds, and they told me to stop trying to be so hip because I was embarrassing <laughs> myself. So <laughs> I had a bit of rejigging to do. Trying to be down with the kids. Yeah, yeah. My daughter tells me that nearly every day. Don't worry, Kat. <laughs> You're good. I'm glad to hear. It. <laughs> well, as you might have guessed from the title of your titles of some of your books, you did spend thirty years in the finance sector. I did. How did you get started in that kind of world? In the first place? Oh, I left school at um, 17. I was a swatty little smarty pants and did my A-levels a year early and was planning to go off to university, but then got myself a job at Barclays um, to fill in the year and um, just stayed, got used to earning a living um, and stayed in the banking arena. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed some of it, um, but I was very competitive, very... um, kind of intellectually arrogant I liked being the person who knew all the answers Um, a bit of a workaholic and by the end of my 30 years it had been very good to me in terms of experience and competence and financial reward but there was a big emptiness inside me it just really wasn't I knew something was wrong and I didn't know what it was Um, and it all culminated in a big crash and burn um, big depressive episode and an alcoholic implosion and weirdly although that's been a terrible time for us in lots of ways including my little girls what's coming out of it is much better I'm almost grateful for that experience because had it not happened I would still be in the finance sector 
diligently working away all hours um, and I wouldn't be doing the amazing things that I've had the chance to do since. Well, you are incredibly open and, and to use your own words, you, you say you're an alcoholic in recovery. Yeah. Is that a label you'll ever drop? Never. If I lost a leg, I wouldn't grow a leg back. If I became diabetic, I wouldn't become undiabetic, I don't think. Um, and I'll always be an alcoholic, hopefully, please God, always in recovery. Um, so that means that I need to be to do certain things to keep me well. Um, and to be vigilant and to look after myself properly because if I don't look after myself I can't look after other people. And that also includes going to AA meetings and that kind of thing. Yeah, all sorts of things. I needed every scrap of help that there was. Um, I made as bad a job of recovering as it's possible to do. Couldn't get sober, couldn't get honest, couldn't get humble enough to do the things that get you well. Um, so I needed help from social services and the drug and alcohol team and Motivate and AA and I also took myself off to Latvia to get um, an implant um, of a drug called Antabuse. Um, so it was very messy um, but it's it's having a, a, a not a happy ending because it's not an ending but it's it's having some good outcomes. Look I think you should be really proud of yourself because it's 10 months since you've had your last drink Mm. and I know that you mentioned there you say that you've been to these local groups like AA and Motivate and what I want to know is what's that like on such a small island going to these local groups knowing that you might bump into somebody that you know or even the person that's counselling you could be someone that you know. Yeah it's a good point that you make and I think island life does make it harder. Obviously AA um, we have strict confidentiality um, uh, traditions and so um, you will doubtless meet people that you know and you just have to trust to the um, to, to people observing those um, there was it was interesting because I think it's motivate who recently earlier this year had a conference after some research that they'd um, they'd asked for and the researchers said that they found the Isle of Man was a particularly difficult place for people to get sober because um, on the one hand, there's a huge drinking culture and there's a lot of people with disposable income. But on the other hand, there's a huge amount of um, shame when you are perceived as being addicted. So people are egging you on to drink before you're identified as alcoholic, but then kind of you're untouchable. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion. We were talking about this before as to whether it's an illness or it's fecklessness. And of course, there are there's some of both. Um so my fecklessness probably got me addicted um but let me tell you once you're in that cycle of addiction nobody would choose that misery for themselves nobody would choose that loss and despair so um a lot of people who are suffering really need help not um not criticism and kat you say um despair and the situations that you've been in you've had two episodes which you're quite open about where you've not had your children with you because they've been taken off you can you just explain what that is like it's 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 um i probably can't explain what it's like actually it's hard to find the words um when you people are saying to you but don't you love your children enough to stop and you don't have the words to explain that you you're in the grip of this compulsion um there's a whole dynamic i think around motherhood and alcoholism or parenthood and alcoholism um where you begin to think actually maybe i'm not the right parent for my children maybe they'd be better off without me I know that not to be true now, but I think every alcoholic mother who's struggling probably goes through some of that feeling, thinking maybe I should just let them go, let them have the kind of life and the mother that they deserve. Thank goodness good friends both within and outside of AA helped me to weather those storms and trusted me and had faith in me when I couldn't do it in myself. And um, and we're a family, um, so... That it's a uh, sorry. It's quite tough stuff to talk about, no, but I'm glad no. I'm glad that it's being aired because there is a lot of misery out there. And the one thing that is one really good thing about what I've been through is hopefully other people can learn from my experience and reach out and get the help that is there without being ashamed. Now, should we take the Barbies and dolls away from young girls and replace them with Lego and Meccano? Well, one of Britain's top female scientists thinks so, saying girls should stop playing with dolls and make way for more creative toys. Dame Athena Donald from Cambridge University thinks girly toys, in inverted commas, are holding back girls who might otherwise go on to study science and engineering. She says we need to change the way we think about boys and girls and what's appropriate for them from a very early age. Does the choice 
use of toy matter? I believe it does. She also says, We introduce social constructs by stereotyping what toys boys and girls receive from the earliest age. Girls' toys are typically liable to lead to passivity, combing the hair of Barbie, for instance, not building, imagining or being creative with Lego or Meccano. She's also criticised schools for giving pupils work experience placements that reinforce gender stereotypes. But, and I think you might have heard Joe slightly disagreeing, but so does parenting psychologist Dr Amanda Gummer. Children need to be able to play with a wide range of toys without stigma. So if girls want to play with Lego, great, let them play with Lego. If boys want to play with dolls, they'll learn different skills, they develop differently according to what they play with. But to say that playing with a Barbie prevents children going on to be engineers, I think there's no evidence for that at all. And psychologist Linda Papadopoulos says there are other factors which affect career choices. The issue is, and this is what psychologists have known for years, that same-sex schools, we know that girls tend to do a lot more male-orientated subjects, so they'll do a lot of more of the STEM subjects. One of the reasons cited for this is that they feel more able to take chances and not be embarrassed in front of boys, which I find <laughs> very telling. So what do you think? Should we be taking away the dolls and instead giving young girls Lego to play with? You can text 166-167 to let us know your thoughts or email womentoday at manxradio.com. But Joe, I heard you scoffing. <laughs> You've obviously got some thoughts. Oh, it's just crazy, isn't it? It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, yes, give give girls and boys a wide selection of toys. It's obviously great in the house if you've got a girl and a boy and they choose what toys they want to play with. But to say that if they're choosing to uh, obviously comb the hair of a Barbie means that they're not going to be going into engineering or something. There is no proof in this whatsoever. Um, in fact, I'd like to speak to some female engineers and see what they used to play with when they were younger. Um, I don't think that we should be necessary, you know, if it's a girl's birthday, maybe giving her a girly present. I agree with that. Maybe give them something that's quite unisex. But, oh, where are we going with all this? It's, it's just... I've got to say, I'm with you. I, I do think it raises some really important points about stereotyping what girls and boys should be playing with. But I don't think there's anything to say we should be taking away dolls if a child enjoys playing with a doll but I think the same goes for boys oh here's a doll if you want to play with a doll it does not matter and I think with this we're trying to make it so simple and neat and make it all about toys they play with as children and it's not that simple and we're really missing quite a lot of the other important stuff by just focusing on toys totally I would like to see though something done where maybe they open up Hamleys and they send in a load of kids and see where they go to, what actually attracts them to what toys. I've never had a Barbie in my entire life, and I loved Action Men, I loved Batman, I loved I loved Lego, like seriously loved Lego. You still do? I'm still not an engineer, though, <laughs> so I'm not convinced there's that much of a, of a link. Erin, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I suppose you could say it the other way around. If you were to take the Barbies off them, then you could argue that then they wouldn't go into caring roles of looking after, like other humans you know like nursing and things like that i think yeah, all true. play is so important and we've spoken on this program before about um children going outside and the things that they learn just through the art of playing and i think it's more important that we cling on to that than try and dictate you can and can't play with this surely yeah for sure again it goes back into you said the key word there dictating and that's something that we're seeing far too much, isn't it, in this day and age? And we need to stop dictating and wrapping up in cotton wool and, and let kids just decide what they want to play with. But also as a parent, if you do see your son playing with a doll, don't get all worried about it. Let them, because there's plenty of doctors out there and maybe that's how they start off their career. Who knows? To play devil's advocate, though, we do often hear about the fact that not enough women are going into the sciences or into engineering and that is something though that I do think we need to address but I, I'm just not convinced that it's toys. No, definitely not. And I went to a single sex school because I went to boarding school where it was a girls school and we didn't have any of these subjects that we were able to do because it was very much concentrated on what girls were supposed to be obviously educated on. We didn't have things like carpentry, you know, um, whereas if I went to a mixed educate, um, mixed um, co-ed school, yeah, that I would have actually been offered those and perhaps be able to take it up. So I think there is something there that if you do go to a single sex school nowadays, they should be offering a wider range of subjects to maybe choose from. Well, the psychologist there was saying that single-sex schools can benefit girls because they're not put off from trying and possibly failing at subjects in front of the boys. Do you think that's true from a single-sex school point of view? Possibly, but they, are, they aren't they are offered. 
you know, a lot of these schools don't offer these types of subjects. So that's a fail in the first place. Um, but also girls are really competitive against each other, to be fair. Um, you know, and like we were saying about the gyms before, in a single sex school, yes, in the classrooms, I I can't see that, that it would be apart from, you know, maybe you fancy a boy and actually, you know, you're wanting to look good in front of him. Apart from that, the competition is still pretty high in a single sex school. Women have done it for as long as the sport has existed, but there are still many people who don't think it's right, and at some point in history, most nations have banned it. Kate's just limbering up in the corner there. One of your favourite films? Um, yes, love it, seen it hundreds of times or yeah <laughs> uh, well this afternoon we are talking about women's boxing and we're joined in the studio by Viking boxing head coach Jewan Thomas and also Rachel Rosenbrook um, but thank you so much to both of you for being here Jewan just tell me first of all where your interest in boxing came from yeah, yeah good afternoon yeah, I was very disappointed you two girls haven't turned up in the gym you did say you were going to come down and try it out and oh, um, oh disappointment yeah. disappointment um, yeah. Very, very busy, busy summer. Busy. Really? Really busy. We'll, we'll make a date in the winter. I don't want my nose to be broken. Mm, oh, it's okay. 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 She's scared I'd beat her as well. Oh, heck no. <laughs> as if. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly what she said to me last week, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. But it is, it's interesting, isn't it? We're talking. Um, we're going to be talking specifically about women in boxing. But, Jewan, you obviously have an interest in boxing. We'll find out where that came from in just a moment. But you're quite open in the fact that when girls, women, first came to Viking Boxing Club, you weren't all that keen on it, were you? Yeah, it, it took a bit of a transition, to be honest. I mean, we've been involved with boxing for, for, for a long time. And obviously, we've, we've trained some decent boxers over the years from the Isle of Man. And um, going back into the early 90s, we, we, I, um, a friend of mine, Coach Jane Couch, who went on to become a world champion, um, and it was, I always had that, uh, is it right for women to box or not? But it, it's the age of equality, and women want to do, you know, everyone wants to do what they want to do, and if it's not hurting anyone else, you know, and well, not no, in that's that way. Like, it is <laughs> but, hurting someone else, though, isn't it? I mean, let's yes, be, but they want to. be honest. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it, it's, it's grown. It's grown over the years, um, and I think in the early years, uh, there wasn't a lot of competition around, as in, you know, the, the sport is well governed. So you have your weights and your ages and everything. And there wasn't a lot of ages and weights around. So the, the, the lady boxing or the girls boxing was finding that they were boxing the same people having to travel a long way to try and get competition. So it has moved on a lot since. Um, and the likes of Nicola Adams obviously has pushed it into the limelight with the Commonwealth Games and the Olympic Games. Um, and a great ambassador for, for women boxing and the sport. Um, and they still we still have issues now because a couple of our girls now we get phone calls from people from you know all over England wanting to match up someone who they can't match at that weight. So you still have problems now of keeping um, women in in sport. Um, but yeah, I've grown with it now. I mean, the women come in and, and they're they're as good, if not better, than some of the guys and more dedicated. So yeah, you just you just you know you, you move along or you get left behind. Um, Rachel Rosenbrook. You are really fairly new to this sport. How long have you been doing it? I've literally been at the boxing club now for about eight to ten weeks. And you're still in one piece? I am, just. <laughs> so what made you want to go and do this in the first place? To be honest, it wasn't my first choice. Um, I was asked to take part in a charity boxing match. And I thought, you know, it's something I've never done before. I've done fitness DVDs, but... On fitness DVDs, you don't have someone trying to throw a punch at you. So it is a lot different. Um, but I have to admit, since going to the boxing club, I've really enjoyed every single session, even the sparring sessions. You do to come out with such a high, a big adrenaline rush. And you do, you feel so much better afterwards for it. And was boxing something that you were remotely interested in before this? Um, as I say, I've done my fitness boxing DVDs. Um, I have to admit, I'd never really thought about maybe doing it competitively or anything, but it's an option that's there. Well, we're going to be talking a little bit more about this um, charity event that's coming up towards the end of September. But, Jewin, what I mean, you've talked a little bit about your views of, of women boxers and how that has changed over the years. But what about um, the other, the male members of the uh, of the club? 
Yeah, but boxing is doing really well on the island at the moment. So yeah, where um, uh, Alaman Boxing's got one one guy away at the moment in Samoa for the Commonwealth Youth Games. Um, uh, John Kane is away there at the moment with um, with Matty Rennie. So the the standard of boxing um, has come up over the years. I mean, I've been involved with my club now for over twenty five years and um, the standards have come up it's a lot of hard work, it's like every sport here we had that problem of raising the money to get off the island to compete um, we can't have football like football have intermatches every week we haven't got that so we have to go away to compete so it is difficult and it's very hard in the sport to you, you have to endure all of the, the, the bad weather going over there in the winter and you know the, the, the travelling and the weights are crucial if you're going into championships so it's difficult and we we always have that extra little bit of, to contend with but um, all our athletes do really well when they go away and, and yeah the, the the standard has come up a lot Has the sport itself changed much to, over 25 years that you've been involved? Yeah it has it, it's um, it, the the biggest thing that's changed really with it's like the, the the head guards coming in, health and safety aspect, medicals. Um, we started coaching twenty years ago with people wearing head guards because the medical authorities said we want people to wear head guards; it's safer. So you, you know you change your style of of how you teach people to adapt with that. And now twenty years down the line, i.e., the world governing body now have decided that. They don't want mailboxes to wear headguards because they've done another medical study and they've changed it. So now juniors wear headguards and um, females still wear headguards and the women wear, wear headguards because um, they've done another study saying that that's what they want to do. So, you know, it's, it, it, everything changes. Rachel, were you not put off at all by the idea of getting hurt? To begin with, yes. Um, but I have to admit, the guys at the gym, they will not put you in the ring unless they think you are... 100% ready to have a little sparring session with someone and we're not going in there to knock each other out in all fairness we're going in there to have a sparring session get a couple of jabs in and to be fair once you get over that first initial punch <laughs> it's actually not too bad after that <laughs> um, Kate had a question about the ring didn't you Kate? Yeah this is a conversation that has come up a couple of times with some friends when we've been sat in a public house as and one we, does yeah, as yes. one does yeah. Why is it called the ring when it's square? <laughs> please, no please idea. put us at rest. <laughs> anyway, we, we must be due for a weather report. <laughs> <laughs> Ask a difficult question like that. <laughs> oh, it's oh, going to well. carry on now. Yeah, let it carry on. Oh. It gives you some conversation, doesn't it? Let it carry on. I think that was a point to you, though. They yeah, you got <laughs> your zing first zing jab in. in. Yeah, all right, we've Pulling got time no to punches. go. Yeah, we'll get evens. <laughs> Women Today, brought to you by CityWing.com for your next flight away. And we're asking now how much responsibility we need to take for our own safety. It's because the singer Chrissy Hind has made headlines this weekend. You may have seen some of the things she said. Essentially, she suggested that women who dress provocatively could attract a man to rape them. The Pretenders star says she blames herself for being sexually abused when she was 21. And speaking to the Sunday Times about her book Reckless, she recalled the incident when she was picked up by a motorcycle gang who promised to take her to a party, but instead took her to an empty house and sexually assaulted assaulted her. She said, If I'm walking around in my underwear and I'm drunk, who else's fault can it be? If I'm walking around and I'm very modestly dressed and I'm keeping to myself and someone attacks me, then I'd say that's his fault. But if I'm being very leery and putting it about and being provocative, then you're enticing someone who's already unhinged. Don't do that. And she added, You know, if you don't want to entice a rapist, don't wear high heels so you can't run from him. If you're wearing something that says, come and me, you'd better be good on your feet. I don't think I'm saying anything controversial, am I? But campaigners say the ill-judged comments are harmful to victims and criminologist Charlotte Barlow thinks she is wrong. This kind of idea can be very damaging for female victims of sexual violence. And this is a part of a wider issue that we call rape myths, so such as she was asking for it, she was too drunk, or that she was wearing provocative dress. And ultimately, this holds the female victim. This kind of narrative reinforces the idea that female victims are somehow responsible for their actions or that they put themselves in that situation. And what's key here is that no victim of rape should be held responsible. 
That is Charlotte Barlow thinking uh, that Chrissy Hines' comments were completely wrong. What do you think? How much responsibility do we need to take for our own safety? And Kate, you're quite adamantly against what Chrissy Hines has said. Absolutely. And I, I just, when I read what Chrissy Hines said, I, I honestly just want to give her a hug and just say, it's not your fault. And I think it's so horribly sad that she in any way blames herself for being assaulted when it's clearly the fault of the perpetrators absolutely and i completely i do completely agree with you and you know we've again talked about this subject many many times before and there is no question that a woman has the right to wear exactly what she wants do exactly what she wants and and not be raped at all but I wonder if there is some truth in what she's saying I'm wondering if actually people do need to think a little bit more about their own actions, about how those actions might be perceived. Ideally, there would be nobody in society who would take advantage of you, but we know that's not the case. So surely what she's saying is, you know, be just a little bit more responsible. I think it's interesting, though, when you look at studies and research that say that approximately 80% of rape victims are raped by someone they know. So what has that got to do with what you're wearing or, or... how what you're wearing may be perceived I think it's so much easier for us all to imagine this this monster of someone and and to try and take control of what could happen when you think of those horrific statistics by taking control of something quite easy like clothing and it gives us a sense of control over something that is actually really quite terrifying and um, we've had uh, some interesting thoughts on this on the Women's Day Facebook page. But we actually had a text in just now saying, my daughter was raped on the Isle of Man. There's no excuse. She wore jeans, but what if she had had a miniskirt on? Rapists need punishing. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing to think about. And I'm sorry for that person who texted in. I also think it's really important that we, we acknowledge the fact that men rape men. And mm. women can also rape men. Nobody ever asks, you know, were you wearing high heels to a man who's been raped? It, it's never, ever that person's fault. And if we get into this situation where we are placing any of the blame on the victim, I think we take away from the actions of the perpetrator and we almost lessen it. And that does nobody any favours. And it also does men no favours by suggesting, well, you couldn't control yourself if she's wearing a short skirt. You can possibly control yourself. And that does men no favours because the vast majority of men obviously aren't like that. I just w- wonder, though, about Chrissy Hind and the fact that she was... <laughs> She's just been totally abused, really, again, for what she has said. And she's been completely honest that she's talking from her own experience. She is saying this is how she feels. And I guess she feels a sort of almost a sense of duty to sort of pass that on because she doesn't want other people to go through it. I think it's a sign of, of the, the culture and, and like we heard from uh, the woman there, that the, the rape myths that we live within as well, that we do have a culture of victim blaming when it comes to rape, I think, personally. And... I think it's it's a sign that she's taken this on. And I think it's horrific that she's been kind of shouted down and called everything under this and for kind of saying women need to take control of themselves from her own personal experience. I don't think that's the way to go about it. But clearly, she's been through something so traumatic that she does need to talk about it. And I still think that at the, the essence of what she's saying, that people do need to take responsibility for themselves, is actually quite a sensible measure. You know, we wouldn't... I don't know, we wouldn't leave our house unlocked and just expect it not to be burgled. We know that we have to take measures to protect ourselves. And I think if that's what she's saying, then that is quite a responsible attitude to have. Yes, but I think we need to look deeper at what actually constitutes or what what can lead to rape. And I think by simply going, oh, well, you didn't protect yourself, we, we stop ourselves from doing that further research and looking into it further and actually looking at the kind of essence of it rather than... Um, yeah, just not going deep enough. Uh, Drew and Thomas, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think it's it's as much a, about being in the way of your surroundings um, as well and, and who you're with. Uh, I think um, when you travel around the world, you see some like, really, really um, seedy or strange places. And, and I think it's it's not about what you wear. And I think, like you say, you've got a right to wear what you want, whether you're male or female. And, and like Kate made the point, it, it, there's as much allegations of, of um, male rape as what there is of female. So I think it's a case of, you know, being comfortable with who you're with, being aware of your surroundings and, and you know, being alert and more than what you're wearing. 
Well, as I say, um, some really interesting thoughts from listeners on this one. Susie has said, I believe we have to take responsibility for our own actions. I think it'd be silly to leave cash in a car seat, leave it in a car park (coughs) and expect it to be there when getting back. Why is this different? There are honest people and a criminal element. Don't encourage the criminals by getting drunk, passing out on the road, half-dressed, as we've seen seen in the papers recently, and then be shocked if you are molested. I don't think she was. Be sensible, stay in a group, look after each other. Would you walk through a dodgy area, dripping in expensive jewellery and expect to stay safe? Date rape or any other kind of rape is disgusting it isn't blame, it's staying safe interesting yeah. thoughts there also on there from the Women's Day Facebook page, uh, Kara says I think what she was rather badly trying to say is don't make yourself vulnerable, that said I think she needs to keep her mouth shut in public, the only person responsible for rape is a rapist it insults all decent men to assume they cannot control themselves. Becky says awful comments to make and dangerous for victims to hear and internalise but it just ends up being a sad reflection of how she views her own abuse, she shouldn't blame herself one bit and Susie says not all rape victims are drunk or scantily clad either so her comment is narrow-minded in more ways than one. And Nora just says disappointing, presumably referring to the comments that Chrissy Hind has made. If you have any thoughts, we'd love to hear what you think. Women Today at manxradio.com or you can text at 166177. Now, for many of us, even getting through maths at school was a challenge, but our guest today knew from a very young age that a career in numbers was the one for her. We are joined live in the studio by Nicola Bowker. Nicola Bowker. Nicola Bowker. I promise that's the only time we're going to do that. Do people do that to you often, Nicola? People do that to me increasingly i've heard your ad which is great yeah. it's great it's, i don't have to introduce myself on the isle of man anymore <laughs> <laughs> now you did go into a county um at the tender age of 16 how did you know at that point that it was a job for you well, you can blame the Scout Association initially. It was because I was voted in as treasurer of the lo- local venture scout unit and I didn't have a clue. So bless him, the, the scout, tr- scout group treasurer showed me what to do and I thought, this is OK. I needed to do some work experience. So I found myself a little job in a firm of accountants at the age of 16. Well, you lived in North London when you did your training. Um, accountancy exams are incredibly high pressured, um, really, really intense. And I just wondered what that period of your life was like. Studying. I, I went from school to uni to do my professional exams very, very quickly. I qualified at the age of 22 and I just studied Uh, We had great big weeks of study, so I'd be off work sometimes for six weeks at a time studying, and we had to sit five exams in the same week uh, for five different subjects, and you could measure the files in feet and inches rather than anything else because you weren't allowed any books in the exam. You had to know everything in your head. (laughs) So it was hard, but I made it. And how many women were you studying alongside, or was it mainly a male? Oh, it was mostly male, yeah. A good 90% male in those days. I think it's higher now in terms of women in accountancy, but certainly there's not still not that much evidence of a large proportion of women in accountancy. I think um, there's only a few of us on the island that are practicing with female accountants. Well, one of the first jobs you did was at the UK head office of Kodak. Just tell me what you were doing there. Well, Kodak was a fun time. It was a great place to work. I started off in the dreaded internal audit department, which, if I'm allowed to say, felt like a bit of a waste of time sometimes because you'd go and check a department over and give them some observations and three years later you'd go back and they still hadn't done it. But um, the rest of the time it was fun. I used to price uh, the very early digital cameras for the professional market. I priced those. The first one I priced was £15,000 back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and pricing film, uh, Super 8 film, uh, and what have you for the motion picture industry, uh, sitting in all the the, me- the production meetings for the, the film industry when the likes of Jurassic Park was out and, and, and hearing all the technical issues of sparklies on the films. I didn't know what sparklies were, but I knew it was a good deal financially, so that was fine. So uh, it was it was a great place to work. It was like a big family. And um, when I, I, I moved around a little bit uh, within the company, as you do in big companies, uh, and, and when I, my last job at Kodak was uh, moving money around the world. Kodak had a lot of spare cash at the end of the month, and we used to make sure it was uh, looked after. So we would have a dealing day once a month, And I needed a bigger calculator because there weren't enough digits on my calculator. Uh, We would be moving hundreds of millions of dollars around on that day. Absolutely huge fun. Somebody else's money. 
<laughs> Sounds like the best online shopping trip. Yeah. Um, sorry to go back to it, but what are sparklies? Well, if you look at a film and you see little, well, it looks like sparkles in the film. Old, you know, you don't get it in digital, but in old-fashioned silver nitrate film, come back to silver in a minute, um, there would sometimes be imperfections in the film which would cause a little white dot on the screen and I couldn't see them. But trust me, the boss could see them. <laughs> so, and they'd have, they, have, they still have rushes at the end of filming every day and somebody from the department would be at the rushes when they were filming to check that the film was okay. So. You mentioned silver because you had a, quite a, an interesting job to do regarding silver bars. Yes, once a year I got the well, dubious joy of driving all the way from Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire to Kirby um, to go and count the silver bars which are held in a, well, used to be held in a safe in Kirby in the silver reprocessing plant, plant for Kodak because I don't know if anybody, everybody's aware that old-fashioned uh, film has uh, silver in it which is how you create uh, the image and when the film is processed they don't just throw it away, they take it out and they, they reprocess the silver out of it and use it again for another film another day. So we used to have to make sure nobody had stolen the film and we were getting the appropriate percentage of silver out of the film, which was something ridiculous, like 99% of the silver would be reprocessed. So going from that then, I mean, doing incredibly high pressure, you know, having the buzz of, of dealing day, which you just talked about, what brought you then to the Isle of Man? Well... There was a little interim of three children. Um, I, I did stop work for briefly for a little while. And while I wasn't working, looking after my youngest uh, children, um, my husband of the day uh, was offered a job here with Barclays uh, in the finance sector. And I'd never heard of the Isle of Man. <laughs> I had to look it up on a map because I was from London. And uh, we came here on a holiday with the children and I loved it. I've always lived outside of London in a village and this is like a big village. And from day one, we kept driving through Laxey and I thought, I could live here. I could live here. This is really nice. And the job offer came and the rest is history. I moved to Laxey and uh, I've been there ever since. Well, you mentioned your three children. I just wanted to know how strict you have been when it comes to their spending. Rubbish. I'm absolutely rubbish. Can I have that, Mum? Uh, yeah, OK. No, I... <laughs> what about your own spending habits? Are you quite good with your own money? I'm terrible. No, really? I, I, I have to have a financial advisor because I worry about everybody else's money except my own. I just... I'm absolutely terrible. I never have any money because I just... I've just spent £65 on a new head torch I can run in the dark with. I mean, <laughs> who needs to spend £65 on a Don't new head torch? Don't go running. Torch? Big advice. <laughs> well, you have got the running bug there. You quite like running around I, the uh, hills of Laxey. I do love running. It's a, a, a recent rediscovery. I used to run at school, at secondary school, and gave it all up and have just recently rediscovered it. Um, much to the joy of my two dogs who get to run with me half the time. But yes, you can often see me running around Laxey, sometimes around the north of the island too. We were talking a little bit about the perceptions people have of accountants. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, you think accountant, typically, as you, as you said, you would probably think man, grey suit. You dispel that completely. And it's quite deliberate as well. You would describe yourself as a very colourful person. Yeah. Don't do grey. Don't do grey at all. No, very colourful. Um, in in what I wear, I, I like to think that I'm not your typical grey, boring accountant. I certainly like to uh, treat all of my clients individually and talk to them in a, in a way that they will understand. Because who cares about accounting te technical terms when they don't mean anything to you? So I try not to use them um, and make it easy for my clients. How does it feel that a lot of people try and hide things from you? Uh, I can spot those. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. <laughs> and we're not daft. That suit really isn't a business expense. And neither was were all of those meals out in the evening. <laughs> what type of person do you think should have an accountant? Do you think everyone should? Not everyone. People who earn a salary uh, day in, day out don't need an accountant. The people who tend to need an accountant are self-employed, run their own company or have slightly more complicated tax affairs. They might have a large number of investments. They might have property that's rented out. They might have to fill out UK tax return as well as Manx tax return. 
Um, when you start getting into those sort of areas, quite often um, there are tricks we know and the tax office won't tell you. So uh, if you come and seek advice, even if you decide not to go for it, it's usually worth the conversation to make sure that you're not going to benefit from using an accountant, which you usually do, and most people do plump for using somebody to do that because there's more to life than filling out a tax return. Now, even just thinking about our guest today has made me exhausted. (laughs) I think it's probably fair to say she's one of the fittest people who's ever sat in front of me in the studio and she's certainly the strongest woman we've had. Can we just say from an athletic point of view, the fittest I think she's pretty fit as well. (laughs) Erin Bonnet runs her own gym in Douglas with her husband Dan and is a fully qualified physiotherapist with her own practice too. She says she trains five days a week with at least four of the days having both a morning and afternoon session. And as a couple, they're so into fitness, they even got married in their gym. Erin, I've got to ask you, did you walk down the aisle in sweatpants? (laughs) No, I didn't. Although I did put some of my lifting shoes on underneath my dress for some photographs. (laughs) You blow my mind. (laughs) Carrying weights. Yeah. (laughs) Walking down the aisle. (laughs) We're going to talk more about what you're up to these days in terms of fitness and exercise a little later. But first of all, let's go back to your childhood because you were born here. You were raised here as well. Yeah, um, born in the Jane Cruckle. Um, I grew up in Kurt Michael, went to Kurt Michael Primary School. Then I went to Kiwi 2 in Peel. And how sporty were you when you were at school? Um, Sporty, but I didn't specialise in anything particularly. Um, I liked running. But apart from that, um, just a little bit of everything, really. Um, I didn't get into ladies football until um, I was about 14, 15, and that's when I started playing for the Ireland team. You played for the Ireland team, as you say, and you also represented the Ireland at the Ireland Games. Yes. What um, was that like? Well, it was cold and wet, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Very cold and wet. Um, I I wasn't in the start in 11. Um, I started when I was... uh, I started football when I was 15 and went to the Ireland Games that year, um, so I, I got a couple of uh, I got a couple of games and I got an injury just before I went. Um, so that was a bit disappointing, but it was good, good, good experience. Talk me through then your further education because you went to Edge Hill University first of all. What were you doing there? Um, I went to Edge Hill University to do sports therapy. Uh, I wanted to be a physio. I was told in school that I wasn't clever enough to be a physio because uh, I I never got an A in school in anything. Um, and as far as I was aware, to get onto a physio degree, you need A grades. So I was advised to go down the sports therapy route because um, it was a lot easier to get onto a sports therapy degree. So um, I, I applied for that and went um, straight away. Didn't take a gap year, just went straight through from school. Do you think they were right or do you think you you could have given it a go then at doing physiotherapy straight away? Uh, Well, I got a first class honours, so I made sure that my head of year was the first person to know about that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you did. (laughs) Well, you did eventually study physio. physio. You went to uh, Huddersfield University. How did it feel to finally do that thing you'd wanted to do for so long? It was good. It was... um, to to get onto that, um, I think having the first in sports therapy helped because um, it's quite a difficult course to get onto the postgraduate physiotherapy. So um, it was very different. I think I was actually shocked that I probably enjoyed the sports therapy more. Um, there was a there was a big side to physiotherapy that maybe I didn't consider um, before I went, and it was it was all the. Um, neurological side of things that was really hard to get my head around um, whereas really I suppose the three years in sports therapy was was perfect for me um, I don't have any regrets about going and doing the physiotherapy but there was a lot of placements in hospitals that I found quite tough um, you know we were, we were getting up at five o'clock in the morning and traveling from Huddersfield to um, York sometimes it was they were they were long train journeys um, but it was all good experience and I wouldn't change it now. What kind of student were you? Because I'm look- thinking back to my own university days. It was a lot of late nights and a lot of takeaways. And I can't imagine you sitting in front of me in your gym kit. I can't imagine you eating a takeaway, if I'm honest. Uh, no, I did. I did <laughs> eat a takeaway. But um, I, I generally would be um, partying all night, um, takeaway on the way home. But then I'd be up first thing, spinach omelette for breakfast, out for a run and then back to drinking 
and spinach omelettes. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Well, you met your then boyfriend and now husband and moved to Manchester where he was a firefighter working in a, a really busy station. I just wonder what that was like for you to, to support him through that and to see him go off to, to fight fires, really. Yeah, it was hard, um, really difficult. It was when... It was when I was at Huddersfield, um, I was living in a studio apartment and he was sort of living with me and then travelling between Manchester and Huddersfield. Um, firefighting hours, he was working four days on, four days off. Um, so the four days off were great. Um, it was it was tough because I was kind of in Huddersfield by myself, really, when he wasn't there. Uh, a lot of my friends who were on the course with me used to travel in so when he wasn't there I was on my own a lot of the time really so having him not there and knowing what he was up to at Gorton which was Manchester's one of Manchester's busiest stations was hard it was always nice to have him home did your imagination kind of run wild I guess with the with oh, yeah. what he was putting himself through yeah and then he'd come home and tell me what he'd been doing so that made it even more difficult but um it, he's uh he he decided that um you know we would open the the gym together and uh he was like a cat running out of his nine lives so time for a change of career perhaps yes. well you worked first though in a ladies only gym what was that like and why do you think some women prefer that environment um the whereabouts it was um was in farmworth in manchester near bolton um so Culture, culture was a big reason, really, um, why why a lot of the ladies, um, you know, preferred to be in a, a ladies only gym. Um, a lot of the time, it's confidence, really. Um, people people would rather not have um, not have the males there in in the same gym. Although I've spoken to people and said that you know sometimes they feel quite the opposite really with having women looking at them and what they're wearing i would say it'd be quite competitive actually yeah. having women kind of even checking out what label is even on their attire that they're wearing mm. as well yeah how did it feel then when you made the decision to to move back to the isle of man open your own gym and you'd, you'd finally knew that was what you were going to do it was almost a decision that we'd made overnight, really. Um, I planned on staying in England a lot longer. Um, I liked the fact that you could go to Asda at two o'clock in the morning. And um, f- for me, it was, you know, England was a, a big and better place. And uh, one day it finally clicked. And my mum and dad um, had a little cottage that they had renovated and said, you know, the cottage is there if you want it. Um And I just kind of took a step back and thought, what am I doing working, you know, for six pound an hour in Manchester um, with two degrees when there's a cottage waiting for me at home and bigger and better things to go and do. So um, we almost made the decision overnight, packed everything into the Fiesta and uh, (laughs) and um, yeah, got on the Ben McCree that night, really. And you knew what you were coming home to do. Yeah, we started looking. Um, we started looking at units uh, to to open our own place whilst we were away. But we thought the best thing to do is just to come over and see things for for real. And how long ago was that? We moved back in April two thousand and twelve, um, and we started painting the walls of the unit in July two thousand and twelve. So it was a fast move. And how are you enjoying being back home, being on the island now that you're kind of a grown up with your husband and your own business? <laughs> it's good. It's it's perfect. Um, I love having the family nearby. Uh, my brother lives next door. Um, my other brother and sister and mum and dad all live in walking distance in Kurt Michael. So it's great being so close to everyone. And home's home. Always. Well, Erin Bonnet, thank you so much for being our guest today. Later in the programme, we'll be finding out more about the sports you compete in nowadays. But you are a competitive weightlifter, and I just wanted to ask, just to tease it a little bit, how much can you actually lift? Um, Deadlift, 130 kilograms. So that's where you lift it to your waist. And um, maximum weight above my head is 90 kilograms. That's pretty incredible, isn't it, Kate? I am gobsmacked. Can you do 5k? What, run it? No, like literally lift, lift it. it. Oh, so that, I don't even know the lingo. I have absolutely no, no I think, <laughs> is the pretty clear answer to that one. And Anyone uh, in Manx Radio, if there's any weights anywhere, can we bring them up and see if she can? I'm struggling just to hold my pen right now, Joe. It's fine. <laughs> 
thanks to all our guests this week. And don't forget, if you miss a show, you can listen again to the whole thing for seven days on manxradio.com or join us live every weekday from just after two o'clock. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.